Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Hollywood Swinging with myself, your co-host, Stephen Bishop, and my always debonair and dapper co-host, Jerry Hairston Jr., a.k.a. the J. Hay Kid, a.k.a. the Denzel Doppelganger, a.k.a. the Legacy. Jerry, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. You know, I, I, that intro never gets old. Uh, I, I know the Denzel thing may shake some people, but again, it's not me saying it. It's just when I'm around town in L.A., you know, it could be a person 98 years old squinting. Is that Denzel? Is that Denzel? No, no, no. I'm Jerry. But uh, yeah. again, it's not me saying it. It's just the, the older people in L.A. for some reason uh, think I look like Denzel. I, I don't think so. Well, well, hey, you know, everybody gets their 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 doppelgangers. And, and perhaps if you look closely and squint, you're Denzel's doppelganger and he and he yours. But let's talk about something else right now, Jerry. This is all the theme of today's show is this right here. Let me show you. That's it. Hmm. That's it. Can you see that? Anybody I can see, see it that? very well. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the goat. A goat, right? So our, our, our guest today needs no introduction. Absolutely no introduction whatsoever. However, since the introduction is so freaking impressive, I'm going to do it anyway, Jerry. Our guest today is a 22-year Major League veteran, a 14-time All-Star, a seven-time MVP. Only one other man in the history of the Big Four in American sports has won more MVPs, and that's the great one, Wayne Gretzky, in hockey. A eight-time Gold Glove winner, a 12-time Silver Slugger Award winner, a two-time batting champion, and the only man in the history of baseball to have 500 home runs and 500 steals. Okay, and now we're not, we're not even going to talk about his college career at Arizona State, where he was an All-American and voted to the all-time College World Series team. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today, the GOAT, the best player to ever put spikes in baseball, Mr. Barry Bonds. <laughs> Barry, how you doing today? It was long. It was long, oh, right? Yeah, it's long. I don't even remember all that. And I didn't even get in. I didn't even get into the major league record home run, seven hundred sixty-two. The major league record for a single season, seventy-three home runs. The major league record, two two thousand five hundred fifty-eight career walks. Uh, the 609 on base percentage for a single season, the 863 slugging percentage for a single season. These are major league records. It's I'm just incredible. I, I'm just glad we had him muted when you called me the Denzel Washington doppelganger. <laughs> Barry almost fell out in his chair because I saw him. <laughs> but yeah, those, those numbers are impressive. Incredible career, Barry. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> now, now, listen, so, Stephen. I got a chance to play uh, against the greats. I played in, in the late 90s, and my last year was 2013. So I played against Mike Trout. I played against Ken Griffey Jr. I played against Clayton Kershaw, Pedro Martinez, Randy Johnson. So I played in the, in the older era, and I played in the new era where the stars are the stars. But again, the best players that my eyes have ever seen, two guys, and I think Barry would agree with me, is Barry Bonds and Ken Griffey Jr. They had not only a, a presence or an aura about them, they had the substance to back it up. And Barry Bonds, without question, and, and I'm, not, I'm not knocking Albert Pujols, I'm not knack, knocking Manny Ramirez, you know, <clears throat> Ted Williams, I'm not knocking them. They're incredible. But Barry was the only player that I ever played against on the field. Like, he was like the high school kid, his, like a senior high, in high school, playing against seventh graders i'm not exaggerating every time he <laughs> took the field every time he stepped in the batter's box he made us feel like we were seventh graders and he got one pitch to hit in a series i remember when i was with the cubs he barry was yelling at me i was playing second base we kept walking him he gets to second base he goes jerry you ever got you guys ever want to throw to throw to throw to me at all i go no it ain't gonna happen finally dusty gave him one pitch that whole series splash landing in, in, in San Diego, and I'm, I'm sitting there in, in uh, excuse me, San Francisco. He's rounding. I'm yelling at him. That's why we don't pitch to you. One right. pitch that series, he hit it 500 feet. So when you have that kind of a, 
you know, an acumen at a sport, Barry, did, does it feel like you are the greatest every day that you walk out there? Does it, I remember once I asked you, why are you the best player in the game? And I'll tell people the answer you gave me later. But when you're out there, did it feel like you were a man playing amongst children? Or, I mean, how did it feel? No, no, not at all. It's the competition. It's just a level of competition. Playing, just playing the game at a certain level. I mean, I try to tell people all the time, I was very lucky to have my father and Willie Mays with me 24 hours a day. You know, I, I help out a lot of kids and a lot of players um, today. And, you know, I always explain to them that I was very lucky. I had two great instructors all the time. I, I didn't have to figure things out. They figured it out for me. You know, I didn't have to really think about the things that most everyday players have to think about and have to try to figure it out on their own within their, their coaching staffs or whatever. And they may know more than their coaching staffs. They may know less. It doesn't matter. But I had what I feel was the best of the best. My dad and William, my father can pick apart any picture, anything. And all I had to do was just implement it. You know, I just had to just put it. And then as I was maturing, because I always try to tell people, this is a process, you know, this is a long process and you mature every year and you find out things about yourself every year and you'll get better. And if you don't, there's a problem. There's something missing. Um, and so I've always also realized that, you know, my off-season training was way more important in the season because if you're trying to figure out things during the season, it's just too late. You, you should be fine-tuning things during the season more so than trying to figure things out during the season. And that, Jerry, is one of the, is the answer to the question, why are you the best player in baseball? The answer he gave me when I was in his gym at his house in Murrieta, we were working <laughs> out, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. I asked him that question. He said, because I work harder than everybody else. These guys take a couple of months off after the season's over and they go on their vacations and they do what they do. I take two weeks and then I'm back at it. And I, I work as hard as I do to get ready for the next season as I do at any time of the year. And that was, that was the answer that he gave me. And, and you know, it, it makes a lot of sense if you stay doing it and you keep working even with the talent that you were blessed with and the instruction that you were blessed with, it, you're bound to be at, at an advanced level all the time. Well, if you want to keep up at that high level, guys, I mean, you're talking professional level with any sport. To keep up, you've got to always keep challenging yourself. You always have to keep working on your skill because it can, it, people can jump at any time and, and the level could change at any time. And if you're not prepared for those changes, then, you know, if you're taking time off, it's like, you know, I got to get my arm ready again if I took three months off. I got to do this again. And you can lose things. So I kind of didn't want to ever lose that momentum. As I say, it's just that momentum of consistency and that momentum of learning and then, and then maturing and then implementing it on the field. You know, Barry, you, you, you may not... You may not remember this. In, in 2004, I remember you, I was with the Orioles in 2004. San Francisco came to Baltimore. And I remember mm -hmm. you working out early in our weight room. And I remember mm -hmm. you having a conversation with David Sagi, and I kind of piggybacked, yeah. kind of listening in. And I remember seeing how hard you worked before the game. You know, I used to always kind of work out, you know, I'd work out after the game or I'd make sure I'd work out. If I had an off day, I'd, I'd really get my workout in. You said you wanted to maintain your flexibility, your strength. Even, even knowing you're going to get four or five at-bats and play left field. And I remember you having uh, a conversation with David and myself. I was a young player then. You said, yes, the strength is great, but my mental, the way I prepare myself mentally, when I step up to the plate, right before I walk up to the plate, as I'm walking up to the plate, you say in your mind, I'm the best hitter in the world. I don't care if Frank Thomas is in Chicago. I don't care if Ken, Ken Griffey Jr. is in Seattle. Right now, as I'm walking up to the plate, I'm the best hitter in the world. And I stole that from you. I was hitting about a buck 30 at that time. It was early in the season. And I ended up hitting 300 that year for the first time in my career, 303, because I said, you know what? I'm going to lie to myself. I'm better than Barry Bonds. I'm better than Ken Griffey Jr. at this moment. And just for you saying that, I go, I'm going to steal that from Barry. Now, obviously, I'm not Barry Bonds. I'm not Ken Griffey Jr. But if I can be that mentally, I give myself the best chance to succeed. And I just remember how powerful your mind was 
obviously, to go along with your skills. Well, yeah, Jerry, what I meant by that is that I learned that from Tony Gwynn. I always, you know, I always go back to Tony Gwynn and, and, and you know, he's, he was one of my, my idols as well as so many others during the course. But, you know, I remember in San Diego with Tony Gwynn and he, Tony always had his little secret hitting things where he would close the door where you really actually couldn't see what he was doing. And I happened to be standing outside that time at the door and I'm looking through this little crack and he's, he's really just playing his game with himself and he's got these cones in places and he's playing this little hitting game with himself. And he's not, you know, he's just using the T and he's just going through mechanical things. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know? And, and, you know, he sat there, you know, he says, use, there's a yellow line here. There's yellow line here. And there's a couple of people that's already told me that too. And Tony said, Chase, and I always thought that when I met by being the, the best hitter out there, Tony Gwynn to me was the best hitter. My generation, Tony Gwynn was always winning the batting title. He was always hitting 300, close to 400. So the best hitter to me was Tony Gwynn. And I said, you know, Tony sat there and told me one time, he said, Barry, chase the batting title. Everything else will come if you chase the batting title. And he was the best. He was the best player, best hitter, average wise, et cetera, so on. Yeah, I can hit home runs, but I wasn't the best hitter. Tony Gwynn, to me, at the moment, was the actually best hitter. And that made sense to me. That resonated into my mind. These, you know, if you're going to get up 500 times, you're going to get up five, 600 plate appearances, chase the batting title. Chase, chase that. And with your natural power and your ability, everything else falls into place. And a lot of times we chase the fence. And then that becomes, now we're hitting 200. We're chasing other things. So Tony said don't be a 10 percent field hitter why not be a a 70 percent field hitter because you can play line to line but you can't be perfect to line to line so you play gap to gap right so that's about 70 percent of the field right and so anywhere between 76 whatever that percentage is of the field and be good there but you got to use it all right and i was you know sometimes you got hitters that are just one dimensional just full hitters or just this and i chased the batting title I never, I got it twice, but I never got it a lot. I didn't, I mean, but I chased it. And That's chasing it was going to give me the 30, 40, 50 home runs. If I chase that, you're going to accidentally hit the balls over the fence. And it's just, it just made sense with me. And it's crazy that you say that because that means that all the batting titles that Tony Gwynn won, he was actually trying to win the batting title. It wasn't like he just, he was after, after the batting title. And that's, that's, that's amazing that he did it. Yeah, he that irked many me. Times. And he irked me. Cause I was going for a triple crown in 93 <laughs> and he, he irked me because we were going at it back and forth. And then he had enough plate appearance and got hurt. And, you know, I couldn't keep that pace up. I mean, when he was playing on the field, I had that motivation, you know, like, oh, okay, Tony got a hit today. I got to get my hits. Or I got to stay and I got to walk and I do something. But then when he got hurt and it was just me by myself and I went 0 for 2, I didn't have a margin to play with, right? Yeah. I didn't have anyone to play with, but just his average. And um, I was always bummed about that, that I didn't really actually get to go head on with him, but he, he he's the best. He was the best hitter, period. When when you say when now that we're talking about chasing the batting title and Tony Gwynn and and you know you have a, a career two ninety eight average, you know Tony's was was up, up, above three hundred and mm -hmm. I I want to know how you feel about the state of the union when it comes to hitting now. I feel as though I would bet money that over the last ten years across the board from high school to the major leagues the collective batting average has dropped. Huh. Be, because of this, because of this launch angle, chasing fly balls, get the ball in the air mentality, and the hitter is no longer chasing the batting title. How do you feel about the state of the union and the direction that hitting is going right now? I don't blame players. I mean, you can't really blame players. Major League Baseball dictate what goes on, and the players just adapt. You know, when in my generation, you don't hit close to three hundred, you ain't even in the major leagues. Yeah. I mean, you ain't getting in the major leagues hit 220 or 230 and, you know, that you're not, you're not, you're not making it. Um, so the game has changed and they've just adapted to the, to the changes of the game. And that's what is, has excited the fans. Um, you know, is it, is it wrong for, for me? It wouldn't work for me. 
personally. I want to hit 300. I my generation is different. I mean, but if you told me I can hit 210 and hit 20 home runs and make 200 million dollars, I'll hit 210 and make 200 million, 200 million dollars. You know, these guys are making 200 million dollars in two year players and three year players. That you know, we had to go through free agency. So, do I fault the players? No, the the players are the ones who make the money for the for MLB and the owners. They they deserve every penny they get. I get that. The only thing different of my time to this time is when they, you know, I do get this question a lot. It's like, you know, you know, they, we always have the competition with players. Uh, oh, could you play in our generation? And I'm like, yeah, I can play in your generation. I, matter of fact, I kill your generation. They're like, oh, yep. you all you old players think that you can do this. Not that we think we can do it. We know we can do it. It's not a difference because, it, you know, now there's so much on speed with the pitchers, you know, and plus the pitchers don't last but three innings nowadays or whatever. But everyone in the bullpen or everyone in the pitching staff throws 95 miles an hour. So they don't have to adapt. My generation, you may have a specialist that throws a 64 mile an hour curveball or, you know, the changes of speeds are a lot different in my generation. And then you had a specialist or a closer that threw 100. I got like I tried to tell you, you don't think we had guys that throw 100 miles an hour. We had guys that threw 100 miles an hour, too. No big deal. The harder you throw it, the further it goes. I don't really care. You know, but if you all are going to throw 95 miles an hour and you all are going to be behind in the count, I'm going to beat you. I don't care who you are. Like I'm 58 years old and I don't care how hard you throw, I can still hit it. Now, can I hit it as far? No, I'm not in physical shape to do that. But can I hit the baseball? For sure. In this generation, is it e is it is it a little bit easier? Sure. Why? Because you guys just take batting practice. Pretty much. Nobody gets hit. Nobody gets knocked down. If you if you if you tell me I can go up to the plate, swing a baseball bat, flip it into the stands, high five every single body up there and not get my head taken off, I'm gonna hit a home run almost every time up. Me, I had to get in the plate, hit a home run, and come up the next set back, not even flip my bat or do anything, and know that I'm definitely still gonna get hit, regardless. So I have to either stay in the box learn how to dodge it and swing a bat at the same time. It's just different. It's just a different era. Do I think a player should get hit because they flip their bats or whatever? No, I don't think a player should get hit. I mean, your chances of hitting home runs are still slim based on the, the amount of bats that you do get, you know, and if a pitcher makes a mistake, eat it and move on. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you got to keep a hitter honest and you also got to keep a pitcher honest and, and the, the competitive edge of that i enjoy that that competition of oh you want to come up and in son okay we might have to throw down here for a minute but let's just you know but it's just a chess match it's not really you're trying to hurt me or i'm trying to do whatever but it's just that chess match of i guess focus and concentration that you have to put on yourself as a hitter not knowing what the circumstances could be between you and that guy who technically has a weapon that can throw i said you guys take batting practice so you want to be good master bp because that's all you got to do is master batting practice and that's what i did it's and crazy add, be, barry to add to that uh they just did a study in fact guys aren't really throwing uh harder than they were when, when you played in, in, in the late mm -hmm. 80s 90s because now they're measuring the ball out of the hand you know, back when I played 10 years ago, when you played, they were measuring the fastball, you know, at 10 feet from the plate as it's getting to the plate. So now, back then, if they were throwing 93 miles an hour, it would be measured at 98 miles an hour today because they're coming out of the hand. So even today, mm -hmm. they're not throwing harder. But, but I completely agree with Barry is they're told the pitchers, hey, throw as hard as you can for four or five innings and we're going to get you out of there. And then the next guy, you're going to throw one inning, throw as hard as you can. So they're more throwers now as opposed mm -hmm. to pitchers. And you get a thrower out there facing Barry Bonds, uh, he's going to be sitting 2-1, 2-0 a lot of times and then uh, game over. Yeah, it'd be a lot, it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be a lot of fun. I'm you know? sure it would be. I'm sure it would be. All right, I have to go. My my uh, headphones ran out of juice, guys, so I got to go with the regular speaker now. But, um, you know, we're, we're talking about guys that throw hard and Barry being able to hit them. There's no doubt about that. If you've seen two at-bats that I can call out right now, you know Barry can hit 
whatever you throw up there. The, the, the two I'm thinking about are the World Series at bat against my old college uh, alma mater mate, Troy Percival, that went about 530 feet. And the other, possibly one of the, the most classic best at bats of all time against Eric Gagne where yeah. he fouled ball off, fouled ball off, 98 inside, fouled it off, and then he left one out there 99 miles an hour, and he drilled it to right center out there probably 480. I mean, <laughs> when, you, when you looked at the, the, uh, the collage that ESPN put together the year that you hit those 73 home runs, every swing, whether it went to left field, center field, or right field, every swing looked almost identical. How did you – get into such a groove where no matter where the ball was pitched, you were making a very, very similar pass, a pass at the ball, and the balance was so consistent. And, the, and the, even the little jab step after, after you would hit the ball to whatever field was just almost identical. How did you get so locked in? Practice? I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't really know how to answer that because I really don't know how I did it. I just practice. I mean, practice, 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 perfection, technique, 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 learning balance points, knowing your body, um, understanding um, the physics of the game, understanding the velocity of a pitch to understanding your swing path to understanding if I make this path and the ball's at 62 miles an hour, the ball should technically only go so far on a perfect swing technique wise. Now, if he throws 80, same techniques, so the ball should travel a, a certain distance. Trying to maintain the same technique, technique, regardless of what the speed is of the baseball, is very, very important because the power of the pitcher is going to dictate it. What happens is that, that if that velocity lowers, you try to compress it. And once you try to compress it, the technique fails. And then that's when you're popping it up. Like I, try, I tell everyone, I did what Tony Gwynn did and so many other great hitters before me, Rod Crew, Pete Rose, who I think great, great hitters. You know, I, I tried to take pieces from everyone. I took a little bit from the 300 to 400 hitters to the home run hitters, and I was able to create this because I had the ability to. But I try to tell guys, master batting practice. You've got a guy who sits out there at, what, 60 feet, maybe 50 something feet away from you throws about maybe maximum speed, 73 miles an hour, maybe that he's throwing and he's telling you everything that's coming right to you every single time. And you're popping this up in the cage or you're jamming yourself or you're doing this technique is wrong. Master batting practice with a guy who's trying to make you good. And if you can't place that ball where you want to, then technique is failing. And once you can master that technique, then it, it becomes better. It's the same thing. I'll never forget Eric Davis. He cracks me. That's my boy. And he don't did. forget, Percival and Gagne are awesome pitchers. And I, I have a lot of love for those two guys. Percival has a lot of guts, and so does Gagne. And in both those situations, they both said, you if you hit it, you name it. They didn't like they didn't back down. They didn't try to pitch around. They didn't do any of that stuff. And I knew Percival because I played against him all the time in spring training. Like we, we I mean, they, we're both in Scottsdale, so we went up against each other all the time. And you know, they they both also understand what the game doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna hit on run, doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna their job's to close the game. And in the situation, they had enough runs in the situation to where if I hit it out, it didn't really matter anyway. In theory, it didn't really matter. They still got the next guy out or whatever and won the game. But they weren't going to back down to the, to the situation. They were like, okay, Barry, mano a mano. You want it? Yeah. Here it comes. You can hit yeah. it? Hit it. If you can't, sit your butt down. And I didn't have a problem <laughs> with that. I said, I ain't going to sit down if you're going to challenge me, son, because this ain't going to go down like that. You can win the game, but you ain't going to do that to me. You better throw something else other than that number one, because that's not going to happen. But I have respect for that because I knew the situation. They both knew the situation. And they said, Barry, name it. If you can't, if you. And so technique for me was very important at that moment because I knew what was going to happen. And I sensed it. 
And so I could have swung out of my butt and popped it up or jammed myself or anything. I know Percival's throws like 97, 98 miles an hour. I know Gandhi throws 102 miles an hour. Now it's like, okay, don't get too antsy. They threw a cookie at you. What does most people do? You're going to throw a cookie. I'm going to be like, ah, and then I'm going to jam myself. They threw the cookie at me. I just wanted to hit it. And the ball just went based on their power. It did not go. I had no miracle swing out of this or anything else. I just took the bat and said, boom, you're going to throw it. Bam. And I just hit it. Their power generated the distance of the baseball. It had nothing to do with me. I think now, I had a little bit to do with you, Barry. Well, I made contact, yes. <laughs> I made contact off of Gagne, too, and I hit a line drive base hit. But, again, Barry, I, I guess you're, you're extremely humble. Uh, your technique, obviously, is, is better than anybody I've ever seen. So give yourself a little credit because you were on time perfectly. And I just remember that World Series for uh, Tim Salmon to say that's the furthest ball he's ever seen hit. Because, you know, Salmon, he's seen it just about all in his 20-year career. That's saying something. The best one was off of K-Rock. That's the best story. Because when we were in the World Series, uh, uh, Peter Gammons was, um, we I think we lost to Anaheim. I hit a bullet to first base um, in that series off of K-Rock. When he came, when a young guy, young K-Rock came yeah. in, and he was, they were typing him up to all of this stuff. And um, Peter Gammons came up to me and goes, man, what do you think of K-Rod? He's da 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 And I almost took it as an insult to me going, bro, you, so you, you know, I'm like doing all this, like, who am I? And so I told Peter Gammons, I said, I'm going to tell you something, Peter. I see this kid next time. I'm going to hit this ball so so damn far. You're going to apologize to me. And I just faced that kid in Anaheim, and I put that ball in the cloud. Mm -hmm. I went out to left field, and, you know, they had the guys, all the announcers out there in the field and there, their little under their little tent. And I looked at Peter Gammon, and I said, don't ever challenge me again. <laughs> and he should know, he'll know that story because I told him and I said, I got respect for that kid. Kira was really good. Dominant. But I was just like, okay. <laughs> he took hey, hey Steven, he took it personal. He took I it took, personal. That was the, only that was the only one about it took personal with Camp Peter. I didn't have anything personal against K Rod. He was nasty. And I knew he was nasty. But Peter challenged me. He took me to another level in my head. And said, I was like, no, Peter, don't go there. I mean, that that's like insulting to me. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. We, we're talk we're talking about hitting, and obviously, the, you're the best home run hitter that has ever lived. Incredible player, but kids need to know that you are a complete ball player. You know, mm -hmm. you're one of the best steal, uh, stolen base uh, mm -hmm. threats of all time. Incredible defender in the outfield. Accurate, strong arm. Talk about your all-around game, because I remember I played with Ken Griffey Jr. in Cincinnati, and he didn't want to be known as a home run hitter. And it's no. amazing, the greats like yourself and, and Jr., you guys want to be known as a complete player because that's exactly what you guys were. Well, that's what my godfather was. That was my father. There, you know, there's a five tool and there was a six tool, and that was this. And it was how, how good you can make this. Because we already had the tools. We were, we were, you know, we were gifted as, you know, like I say, you're born to that, right? A little bit. And, you know, it's not like, you know, I'm better than, I mean, I thought Vladimir Girl was the best talented athlete I've ever seen as far as throwing a ball, running as fast as he did and swing and, you know, physique and body, you know, when, when, and, but there was things he chased that I didn't chase, you know, it was a little thinking process that, but, you know, I, I wanted to be like my godfather would really. That was the only dream I ever had since I was five years old. Since I was a baby, was it, to have his approval of me as a baseball player. Um, and taking a lot of walks and, like you said, and stealing, that was part of the game. And, you know, like I try to tell people, I wasn't like the best off the field person. You know, like I mean, when it came off field, I was loner to myself. I didn't really hang out with anybody. I wasn't, you know, like all da 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 in the clubhouse, whatever else. But on the field, I was the best teammate you could ever have because I played the game the way you wanted it to be played. I took walks. I could have swung at a lot of pitches and not gave 
Bobby Bo or Kent or whoever else behind me a chance to swing the bat, but that wasn't, that's not how the game's supposed to be played. I took the walks. I still second to get on base and, and score run. The name of the game is to score more runs than the, your opposition, right? And your time will come. If you don't take walks as a hitter, you're going to dig a hole. Your body can only maintain that for so long. You're going to fatigue. You're going to get tired. And so if you don't take the walks and change the mindset of doing other things and then come back to that, you're going to get, you're, you're, you're going to go like this too much. And, and, and as a hitter, you're always going to ride that roller coaster, that slump roller coaster, I call it. It's those that realize this slump is coming. We all know that. I only panicked when I was hitting good because that, that window's like this. That slump is like this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm trying to just minimize that slump, right? That, that little guy right here, the one that's going to irritate me and frustrate me the most. And so that is, was the name of the game. It was just like, how do I control this guy? This guy was cocky. This guy's head was this. This guy felt like he was invincible. But that window was this big. Been there, done that. But this guy right here is the one that makes you want to jump off the bridge and wonder why you're playing and what's going on. And oh, I, so oh, Barry, I know, <laughs> I know that guy all too well. Trust me, I know right. that guy. <laughs> hey Jerry, so. we, let's talk about this off the field guy because I'm going to tell you a story, Jerry. It's, I'm going to try to keep it brief because I know we have other things to talk about, and Barry probably needs to go soon. But this is about the off the field guy. I was playing baseball at UC Riverside. I got my scholarship and I, you know, a full ride, got my books paid for and everything. And that was a humble brag just to let everybody know that I played college baseball on a full ride Thank scholarship, you. Jerry. Thank you. Uh, but I went into the bookstore and I, I got my books for the first semester and I, I put my check down on the, uh, on the counter and the lady behind the desk says, hey, you must be on the basketball team. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm on the baseball team. She said, oh, wow, they got a black boy on the baseball team? And I was like, yeah, yes, ma'am, they do. She's like, oh, you must be pretty good. I'm like, well, I, I'm, you know, I, I think so. She says, well, my grandson plays baseball. And I said, oh, really? Professionally or college? She said, no, professionally. I said, oh, what's his name? She said, Barry. I said, Barry Bonds? She said, yeah, do you know him? I said, well, yeah, I, I know him. He's the reason I wear number 24 because he was with Pittsburgh at the time. He, and, and she said, well, maybe one day I'll, you know, I'll connect you guys and you can meet him. And I was like, I would love that. Fast forward, she connected us. He gave me a call and invited me down to his home to come work out before my first spring training. All through that off season, before spring training, I would drive down to his house. We would lift weights. We would play catch in his front yard. And then we would drive to the batting cages. Right before my flight, maybe Two days, three days before my flight to uh, West Palm Beach for spring training for the first time, a giant box shows up from Nike. And I'm like, what is this? And I open the box and there's a card inside. It says, Stephen, good luck in your first spring training. You're ready. Your friend, Barry Bonds. And it was all shoes and batting gloves and all kinds of stuff from Nike. This is the guy the guy is off the field. This is the guy who took time to take a college guy under his wing teach me things that I didn't even learn in college. And I was a team leader in hitting in college back-to-back -back seasons. And he taught me so much that prepared me for professional baseball and then sent me a gift when he had his own spring training to worry about. That's the guy that we're talking about now. So, Barry, I want to give you your flowers now about that. <laughs> that was the, one of the greatest things of my life. I truly appreciated you for that, and I'll never forget that. I'll never forget you for that. And, you know, testimony to the, the guy that he is. We're still friends 25 years later. So thank you, Barry, for that. And, and Steven, everything that Steven just don't me. understand that I was under pressure with my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> you were what? I said, I said, Steven didn't know that my, I, I was under pressure with my grandmother. <laughs> oh, well, hey, whatever it was, I'm cool with it. I'm, you know, I got my a chance said, to. Boy, you better take care of that boy right there. I said, I got you, mom. It's okay. I got it. <laughs> Yeah, it was amazing. And we've was been amazing. friends ever since, too. I mean, we've been friends our whole life. I mean, from the day we met. Yeah, and absolutely. That, that testimony to, to who we are. It's good. Who, who gets now, who on the golf course? Who gets who on the golf course? We've only played 
twice, once or twice, I think. I went to his tournament, played once, and I, I don't know if we played somewhere else, though, but he's pretty good. I, I don't really play golf that often, so I'd have to say Steven will beat me. But he hits the golf ball as far as anybody you've ever seen, and it sounds oh, no, like he's it. hitting a baseball bat. Now, listen, one thing I have to say, with all the numbers that I rattled up, and, and Barry, if, after mm -hmm. I say this, if you want to pass on this, you let me know, but I, let me say this. With all the numbers that I rattled off at the top of this show, anybody mm -hmm. who knows anything about sports or baseball in particular would say that any Hall of Fame that doesn't have that man in it is a joke. It's a travesty. It is revision, revisionist history. is similar to what people do when they eliminate certain parts of history from our history books that we give our children to placate and satisfy some groups of people. I want to know if what's going on with the Hall of Fame and all of that with you bothers you at all like it bothers me, or are you so secure in who you were as a player that you know that, okay, this is not about me as a player and my skill level or my numbers. This is about the popularity with, my, with me amongst writers and, you know, that, be that as it may. If you don't want to answer that, pass on. No, I have no, do. like I say, Steve, I have nothing to hide. It, it, it's a little bit of both. Okay, so, you know, honestly, it's a little bit of both. Yeah, does it bother you? Sure, you're, I'm human. I'm not, you know, I'm not some wall sitting over here don't care. Sure, it bothers, it bothers you. But at the same time, I also don't know who I am. And, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, people have to understand something is that the fact of is that I was vindicated. I went to the court, I was in federal court, and I won my case 100%. Where is the vindication of me in my own sport? That's what bothers me. Not so much whatever. I mean, obviously, they don't like me. That's fine. Okay, we don't like each other. I love you now. I mean, we don't like each other at the time. It's fine. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lot older, mature, more, more better for it now than I was back then. Um, but when you go to court, what's the court says? Is, is the media our, our judge and jury or is true facts of what goes on in one's life? I was vindicated. I was, I was convicted of obstruction of justice of a sentence that was overturned, not for anything else, a sentence. Um, rambling is what they called it. And I appealed that charge and I won. I'm not under federal. I'm not a criminal of any kind. I'm not anything. Major League Baseball, the records are still there, you know? And I, I try to tell everybody this. I mean, it doesn't matter who you, you are. And I don't care if they want to judge athletes on performing enhancing drugs or not. It doesn't matter. Major League Baseball, and let's get this clearly and straight, has a, had a rule and has rules, okay? Whether they were broken or not broken, there were rules, some rules. In my era, there was no rules. And the era they changed the rules in 2003 or 2004, whenever the rules started to change, there was rules. There are some people that were convicted of those rules during the case of those rules. Well, Major League Baseball said, if you did X, you were suspended for X, right? The athlete was suspended for X. That means he missed time in baseball. He was punished for that. His numbers still are the same for based on what he's accomplished that does not prevent him from the other part of the, for getting into the Hall of Fame. Has nothing to do with it. If Major League Baseball has punished you for whatever mistakes you made, whether you hit a pitcher, hit a person, you missed five games, or was performing enhancing drugs, you missed 50 games, or whatever that is, Major League Baseball already punished you for those stints. Why is Hall of Fame punishing you? Doesn't make sense. It makes zero sense that you're being double punished for something that you've already been punished for. Yeah, and there are a lot of guys in the in the hall that have had you know questionable things on their on their resumes as well. You know, some spitballers, other guys who have been accused of taking performance enhancing drugs and that kind of thing. So, I I I I, I really appreciate you answering that as honestly as you did. And you know, I you know I love you, man. And I I didn't I would never want to put you in a position to say 
anything you didn't want to say, but I'm glad that you did because it's bothered me for a long time. I'm sure that you see every time that it comes around and I post something about it. You know, I, I, I speak my mind. I've been on Sports Illustrated TV talking about it. I've been on ESPN talking about it. It really bothers me. I really think that, you know, the, the numbers speak for themselves. The numbers that you put up in Pittsburgh before any of that was, in, was you know, an accusation would have mm-hmm. gotten you into the Hall of Fame 85, 95% of the time anyway. So it's not over, Steve. Let's not say it's over. There, there, every three years it comes up. There is a possibility. And I, I belong with my teammates in that Hall of Fame for 100%. And it, it, I'm not going to jade it out. I'm not going to sit there and say the, the dream is still there as long as there is a ballot for it. It could happen when I'm, don't, it can happen when I'm 60, it can happen when I'm 70, it can happen whenever. Hopefully, you know, you don't have to wait that long or I, hopefully I'm not dead. You know, you know, the things that bother me the most about these things is as far as being an African-American, my heroes, my, my black brothers that came through the game are all gone. They're all not here. They, I don't get to stand with them. Of the the people that I were my mentors. You know, Willie's right. old. Right. right. McCovey's gone. Right. Joe Morgan's gone. Um, I can go on and on with all the people that are gone. Frank Robinson gone. There, there's a lot um, of my idols that you know are not there. I hope my mom is still around. If it does happen. You know, I don't know. My mom could be dead. It could never happen. You know, if it never happens, it never happens. But in the scheme of it, I'm going to believe that at some point it will happen. And I'll be able to say thank you to my African-American brothers that were before my time that came up and, and mentored me and, and gave me a path to Major League Baseball. I can say thank you to you. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I truly hope that that happens. And, and it's, you know, obviously it goes without saying that it's deserved. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about on a, on, a, on a lighter note is the fact that you are you have really gotten into a lot of stuff in your in your retirement. You're you know, you're big into cycling and, and camping now. How did you yeah. how did you get into the cycling thing? And I, you, I think you told me you cycle like 50 miles a day or something like that? I cycle about 30. Yeah, it's, you know, it's an average of two hours, two and a half hours, two hours, you know, a lot. Wow. Camping was by accident because I put my foot <laughs> in my mouth. But I love it. I love that, you know. But cycling, is, it's, it, it, it gave me to be able to train in space. You know, baseball, your knees are beat up, your body's beat up, you know, you're just – but I like to train. I don't care. I'm in my gym every day to this day. I'm on my tunnel. You know, I got a tunnel. I'm in my other gym. My gym's working out all the time. I ride a bike, but that's who you are. I can't explain to people. And I try very hard. That is who I am. I, I'd rather be in the gym and out on my bike with people and training than anything else in my life. It's just who I am. I, I enjoy it. I have a passion for it. The, it's, it's hard to explain, but camping was just, I fell into that over COVID. A friend of mine, Daniel, gave me a little checklist. You know, I was so negative, like, oh, camping, that's the four seasons, you know, over Big Head and Eagle. And I'd stay at the, and shoot, I'll be at the Marriott. I'm not staying out on the ground. And, then, and, I, I, and I'll tell you this story, because it, it, it's really, really funny, because he told me, he said, if I could check off all your negative boxes, Without you saying a word, the only thing you can do is say check. Will you go camping? I said, if you can do check off my box, I'm, I'll buy, I'll buy a truck, and I'm going. And you know, my words bond. If I say that, you bet baseball, you got to keep it, right? So he says, tell me this. He says, have you ever gone to the bathroom outside your lifetime? Check. He says, have you ever had to take a shower or anything, rinse off or anything outside? Check. He said, have you ever had a barbecue grilled or anything outside? I said, check. He said, and I'm thinking there's something in here. He can't get this one. He's never going to get this one, just to make it short. At the very end of it, he says, 
Hey, Barry, have you ever been a hotel or motel that was just so bad you couldn't take it and you left? I said, check. He says, if you don't like it, son, drive away. And I was like, <laughs> mate, I'm screwed and I got to go. So he checked off all that negative box in my head. And I couldn't believe he got it because I was thinking, oh, no, I ain't sleeping on no ground. He said, if you ever, you know, you slept in a tent with your, you know, friends outside, sleepovers. Yeah, sleeping bag. Yeah, you know, all this stuff. So I did it. I loved it. It was amazing. I've never seen anything, you know, places that, you know, waterfalls that are coming that you couldn't get there unless you drove. Um, and I've met some really good, fun people that I would have never met in my entire lifetime if I didn't dive in. And so it's been a great experience. I love it. I have my Bronco Raptor all laid out and like tent and have fun. At first, Barry, it was I would, a, love, a I would love to see you discovery. With the- I would love to see you with a headband, you know what I'm saying, with the with the Rambo knife going out hunting, spear spear fishing and and, and I and hunt my animals are right there. My hunting animals are on my wall. I hunt. That's that's no secret. <laughs> I've been to Africa. I've got a I got a bunch of animals from hunt, hunting. I bow hunt and I gotta thank Ryan Klesko for that because Ryan Klesko was the one who got me into hunting. He took me to his house to go skeet shooting one time. And I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. And I went over there. He said, you could do it. And we went hunting. And Ryan Klesk was the one who took me my first hunt. And ever since then, I've been hooked. That's crazy. Ryan told me in uh, spring training when I was with the Braves, he was with the Braves. I said, hey, man, give me some advice as a hitter. He said, swing hard in case you hit it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. too. That's he right. does that all the time. Because he used to swing hard and just go. I said, dude, just close your eyes. You ain't hit nothing. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he's a good man. He's a really good, man. you know, he's a good dude. I love Klesko. That's my boy. I lost to Klesko in your tournament, Barry. You, you had that uh, poker tournament in spring training. I think it was 2005 or six. Yeah, Kle- yeah. Kles- Klesko got me in, on the poker table. Yeah. <laughs> That's what all of us thought we were poker kings. We sucked. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, I, I really appreciate you doing this, man. It, you know, like I said, you've done a lot for me in life, and and this is just another, uh, you know, thing on my tab of things that I owe you for, man. I really appreciate you being here, and this was a oh, great you froze. He yeah. froze. He did freeze. I froze? I'll, I'll piggyback off of Stephen because he's frozen right now. He's got that model look. He thinks you know. Yeah. He's a model. <laughs> he thinks he's so beautiful. But Barry, hey, on behalf of us, man, we want to thank you for coming on. Uh, it, listen, I played against a lot of great players. You by far are the best. A player I've ever seen, you and Kegrafy Jr. Uh, player, not home run hitter, player. Right. You could do yeah, it all. So great. Junior is, is is very special. That kid did get hurt. It would be probably unbelievable what everyone would have seen. Yeah. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Very. Uh, hey man, wanna thank you. And in behalf yeah. of Stephen Bishop, Barry mm-hmm. Bonds, this is Jerry Hairston Jr. Hollywood Swing.